So I remember when my son Dylan was in third grade and he had an assignment to write about his future goals. And one of the goals that Dylan wrote down was, I want to go to college. Now, I was like pretty surprised. I wasn't sure how he even thought of that. And it was kind of like, well, Dylan, uh, I, yeah, that's nice, but I'm not sure that's really gonna happen. Well, as he continued in school, he was always fully included in general ed classes. And when he got to high school, he saw his brother and sister taking college tours and his friends going to visit different colleges. And Dylan started talking more and more about him wanting to go to college. So, you know, as a mom, it's like you have this urge and this need to make sure that your kids, you know, achieve their goals. So I said, well, Dylan, we can look into it, but I don't know if there's going to be a college that will let somebody with Down syndrome come to their college. Well, uh, Dylan proves us wrong in a lot of circumstances. <laughs> Dylan went on a couple college visits and tours, and he decided the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs was where he wanted to go. So I put on my advocacy hat, and I talked to several different people at the university and just hit roadblock after roadblock. Um, most of the people I talked to said, no, people with Down syndrome don't come to the university. You could have your son go to the community college. Well, that's not where Dylan wanted to go. Luckily, there was a new professor on campus, Christy Casa in the special education department. And Christy not only is a champion of inclusion for students preschool through 12th grade, but also for college and university level. So Christy became our best friend and ally. She got us an appointment with the vice chancellor at the university. So my husband, Dylan and I and Christy went to talk to the vice chancellor about how to open up the opportunity for Dylan to take classes at the university. And I'll never forget one of the things that the vice chancellor said to us. Well, actually he said it directly to Dylan. He said, Dylan, this university is here to serve the community and you are part of the community. And it was like, wow, we want to clone this vice chancellor and put him in every university around the country, right? So Dylan was able to go in audit classes. There wasn't a formal program at that time at the university. But starting in 2007, when he was 18 years old, he audited classes at the University of Colorado for four years. And it's been the richest experience in his life, I think. Um, so I am so excited to kind of come full circle today and talk about a wonderful inclusive education program that now exists at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Christy Casa is still there and is still championing inclusion. And there are other people that are also helping this um, opportunity grow. One of the um, persons that is helping now is the inclusion coordinator. And that is Julie Harmon. And I'm going to bring Julie and Ben on here. Um, so Julie Harmon, you might know if you've ever been to a peak inclusion conference. Julie worked at Peak Parent Center for 17 years and is now at the university um, helping students with intellectual disabilities be fully included and have that rich college experience. And we also have a resident expert with us today. <laughs> and so I'm glad that Ben Kim is with us. He is a sophomore at the university now, has been um, receiving supports from the inclusion office on campus. And so Ben is going to be talking to us today about what college is like and how things have been going for him. So welcome, Julie and Ben. Thank you. Thank you. 
<laughs> so Julie, um, is there anything else that you want to say as far as an introduction or Ben, if there's any other things that you would like to share with our viewers? Do you want to do any more introduction or do you, or do you feel good? I think I might have an introduction. Do you want to wait till you do your slides or you want to do it now? I could do it now. Okay. I just want to make sure they can see. Hi everybody. My name is Ben Kim and I will be presenting to you all today about my college life experience and how and how it has been going for me. I hope you all will enjoy this presentation as much as I do. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. You're welcome. So Julie, do you want to tell us any dark secrets about yourself? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure I have any dark secrets, but um, as Charmaine said, I did work at Peak Parent Center for 17 years before coming to the university. And I was talking to Charmaine yesterday, and it was that idea of the work I did there just was that this was the next, the most natural next step. So I supported families to work and build towards those inclusive dreams from early childhood, which was a huge focus I had at Peak to helping families navigate through school systems and then navigate to high school. And then there was this idea of what happens to inclusion at the end. And so for me, the next natural place to go was what happens at the end of school and that's college. And so um, it has definitely been my dream job to be here for the last almost four years, um, building something that Christy and I have dreamed about for years um, and seeing it come true every single day is um, a powerful thing and a good reminder to us. Cool. Well, Julie does have a PowerPoint that we're going to show. Um, and also, I want to remind our viewers that if you have questions or comments, type them in the box, even if you're watching the replay, because I'll circle back and I can um, respond to those. I also wanted to share with people that Julie has a wonderful handout about um, 10 tips that students can take to prepare to go to college. So if you type 10 tips in the comments, um, my IEP bot hopefully is awake and working and she will send you that automatically. Actually, when you type 10 tips in, you'll get a message from my IEP bot. She'll say type 10 tips again, you'll do that and then you'll get the link. Um, so, Julie, would this be a good time to bring up the PowerPoint? Yes, if you want to bring up the PowerPoint, we can start there. Um, so uh, um, that's me and Ben, and that's the students that we are currently serving uh, this year. And I'm going to talk about what kind of where we are now and where we see our growth going. So we want to go to the next slide. This is a video, and I do want to do a disclaimer before we move to this video. We are getting ready to make a new one. We're filming in two weeks. Um, I, um, to be totally transparent, I am a parent of two children that have Down syndrome. My oldest son is 28, which is shocking to me, but he's 28, and his situation was similar to what Charmaine shared about Dylan. When he came out of high school, he wanted to go to college. And so he did come to UCCS, he did audit classes. But what we always felt like we were coming through the back door and not the front door. And it was really hard to share with other families how to be successful when there wasn't the support that needed to be in place to have more than a couple students on campus. And having two two loved ones with Down syndrome, I wanted to make sure that eight years later when Noah was ready to go to college that we were going through the front front door with flags going. And it wasn't something that was a secretive type of thing that we could we didn't talk about or we didn't share and that the university as a whole had accepted the work that we were doing. And so um, in doing so in this video, I'm wearing a hat as a parent. And so I just wanna be clear about that as the video runs, it's really more my my parent view, and then Christy, the director of our office, is on for more of a the admin role. But I just I don't want to I want to do a disclaimer so people know where I'm coming from with two the two a couple of hats I wear here and the many hats I wear in our community. So if you want to start the video and then we'll go on with the presentation. Okay. So we need everyone to say yes. This is going to work. <laughs> Yes, it is. Besides a black screen, we're going to see a video. 
My son goes to UCCS, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So now, of course, it's going to go in this spin cycle, right? Uh, I don't know. Let me refresh that and see if it. My son goes to UCCS, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And what does it mean to have your son attend college? You know, it means a lot. It means a lot to us as a family, but I think the thing that it means the most to is it means the most to Nicholas. It means a lot to him to have those same experiences that other children have. Well, I don't know if, let's see. And it's fine if you want to move on, Charmaine. We can share the link so people can watch it if they want. I, I if it, I know tech, oh, technology can be our friend and our foe, so however that works for you. <laughs> I know. So I think it's like, because we're live streaming and then my computer's like, what? You also want me to show a video? <laughs> so let's go back to the PowerPoint. And there's the link, and I'll also put it in the description when we're done. Alrighty, so um, after watching that video, um, so we're going to look at a national perspective and kind of looking at what's happening at a national level, then we'll talk a little bit at a state level what happened in Colorado and how we got to where we are. <clears throat> and then Ben and I will spend a little bit of time talking about just specifically the things that we're doing here at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So the national perspective in 2008, we had the Higher Education Opportunity Act, um, which really opened the door to establishing higher education for students with intellectual disabilities. It put some um, national, um, the Think College, the national organization, and put um, TIPSIT um, programs into different places around the state as well. Typically, there's a grant that people can find. And so we really started looking at what are the best practices around higher education for students with intellectual disabilities. And people have been doing it for a long time. And now what we're trying to figure out is how do we move these programs? And we always like to say here at UCPS that we're an office that provides services similar to the disability service office. So people who go to college that um, receive services under ADA, they can go to the disability service office and get some of those accommodations made through there. And so we view our office similarly because we wanna be careful that we're not just a transition program that's housed on a college campus. We really wanna be the inclusive model of how do you include students in all aspects of post-secondary. And so that national perspective, you wanna to go to the next slide, Charmaine? <clears throat> So the national perspective, the Think College, this is a great website if you have not looked at this, even if you have looked at it, I go to it often. They have great resources. They also have that top <clears throat> link there for college searches. And so you can look by state, you can then dive down into what places have residential um, opportunities because for a lot of people that's going to be a question they're going to have um, and like I said they have lots of resources I highly recommend getting on the Think College obviously you're a Facebook person if you're watching this on Facebook Think College they um, there are lots of great articles and great things that are happening on college campuses and so again at that national level there's um, I think we're down to 40, I want to say 49 states. Colorado was 48th, and I think Oklahoma just um, started um, a college um, pathway. And so I think that puts them at 49, but I haven't looked recently to see if that's really true. So you can see what's in your state. You can see what's near you. And you can see what's going on in the country to see if there's somewhere that you might be interested outside of your state or your, your just your local community. Next slide. So as Charmaine was saying, and as I stated as well, we knew we had to do something different in Colorado. We knew that what was happening here at UCCS was happening here because 
Dr. Costa was here because Christy Costa was here and Christy helped students navigate and help families navigate the we wanted to do something we wanted to put Colorado on the map as a place on the Phoenix College map as a place that any family who was interested in exploring college could come to and not have to know Christy or have to, you know, get the right person to answer the phone. And so in 2014, uh, um, the Colorado Initiative for Inclusive Higher Ed was founded. And this was a group that came together, um, um, that came together to really start looking at what we were gonna do in Colorado and how we were gonna start to build these inclusive programs that we have all that we had all envisioned. And so it was a group of that group that included parents, it was a group that included um, higher ed faculty from higher ed, admin from higher ed. And so what we quickly we came to realize we were going to write a tips and grant. And that's what we thought would be the next natural step for us was to write a grant to give some funding so that we could build that best practice base, that foundation that we needed to then become self-sufficient and be able to support students as we move forward. And so we started to write a tips and grant. And as we like to say at the 11th hour, the university pulled out of the tips and grant. And so for the state of Colorado, we did not submit that grant. And what we thought was the end of the world, and I think, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's that silver lining. We thought that it was the end of the world that we would never see inclusive opportunities in higher ed in Colorado because we did not get the tips of grant. And it wasn't, we didn't even get it submitted. But in order to get the tips of grant submitted, we had to have um, some, we had to reach out to legislation and we had to have support from representatives and senators. And so um, Beth Leon, one of the, the um, initial family members that really was the spearhead behind the Colorado Initiative for Inclusive Higher Ed, when she reached out to let the senators know where we were at, they were like, so you just let it die here? And they said, you know, I think we want to explore this more. And so making a really long story short, what we ended up doing in Colorado was passing the Senate bill. So we passed Senate Bill 196 in the summer of 2016, which is known as the Inclusive Higher Education Act. And it was in collaboration within JFK Partners, which does our evaluations, and the ARC of Colorado and UCCS. We were the leaders behind getting the Senate bill passed. And so what that looked like for us in Colorado was we were we received what they call pilot funding. So three universities, and if you wanna to go to the next slide, Charmaine. Um, so in 2016, his year was made. These three schools were um, were given funding from this state legislation that we passed. So the University of Northern Colorado, which is in Greeley, Colorado, Elevate, which is in a community college, uh, Arapahoe Community College in uh, Denver, and then the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs in Colorado Springs. And so um, a little bit, we've got to get a little bit west of the mountains here in Colorado, which is something that we're working on as a coalition um, so that we have a little, it's not just the front range, but if you looked at the map, that's the front range that those three schools are on. And what that funding did was allow us to, like I said, build the foundation. And it was a five year funding in a line item in the, in the legislation here at the state with some matching funds from other organizations that allowed us um, to start to get an office up and running. We envisioned um, in our Pollyanna way that we would, the bill, the bill passed in June, it was signed in July, and we thought we would have a year to develop that base that we needed, that we would work with the university, we would do training around the university, we would do professional development for teachers, and then we learned very quickly we had to enroll students in the fall of 2016. And so you're talking about a population of people who were not prepared to go to college in lots of different ways, not prepared to go to college financially. Families had to figure the financial piece out and not prepared necessarily the student to um, all of a sudden college is, is a, your reality and how do you make that work? And so in the fall of 2016, we enrolled three students. And so that's where we started. And we're now at 18 students headed into the fall with uh, 23 students. I think if you want to go to the next slide, my math might be off. <laughs> yes, so we're currently serving 16 students. 
And of those 16 students, seven students live here on campus in inclusive housing. And that's kind of an interesting thing. The University of Colorado, Colorado Springs was developed as a um, commuter school originally back in the day. Um, and it's, this school's been here for a while. And then they built up dorms and it's not considered a commuter school anymore, um, except the problem is the housing so overcrowded. And so the dorms for the first year, we did not have any students living on campus. And the nice opportunity that we have here at UCCS is everybody doesn't have to live on campus. So we have seven students who have chose to live on campus in inclusive housing. And then the rest of our students are our commuter students. They live at home. They come to campus three to four days a week. Um, they have the same opportunities as our students living on campus do. Um, all of the activities are open to all of the students. <clears throat> and like I said, in the fall of 2019, we'll have 23 students. And again, when we originally developed the plan and really talked about how things would look here at UCCS, we thought we would cap at 40 students at the end of four years, which we're headed into our fourth year. And what we realized very, very quickly that that growth was gonna need to be slower. That growth for the campus needed to be slower. That growth for the office needed to be slower. Um, and we really wanna do what we're doing right. And we wanted our students to be successful. And so we slowed down the growth and we're taking about five students a year where we're at currently. Um, with our growth. We have 100% retention of our students. All of our students that started almost four years ago are about to graduate. So this time next year, we'll graduate our first three students. And then um, from there, we'll continue to grow as we, um, as our students, as we start to lose students. Our second year, we took eight students. So we'll then have to do our math to get us back up to that 25 number where we'd like to be at. Um, I have three tip topics, three questions I get asked just about every single day. Eligibility is one of them, financial is the other, and then the, the tip sheet that Charmaine told you about, that's the third question I usually get asked. Eligibility, financial piece, and what can I do as a parent or an educator to prepare my student or my loved one today to be ready for college? And so those, that's why we developed that tip sheet to, to help people kind of think about the things that they can do. Um, so eligibility wise, students have to be over the age of 18. And in the state of Colorado, they need to have completed their um, high school um, enrollment, whatever that looks like to them, if that's a high school diploma, if that's a certificate of completion, students in the state of Colorado cannot be duly enrolled. In other places, and if you don't think college, you'll see where one of the questions is, can students be duly enrolled? So you can look through that, but for the state of Colorado, students have to, they, we have some students who come right at 18 and opt out of transition services through public schools. And then we have other families who have gone through the transition and at 21, they come um, to the university. And, and so I wanted to ask you, Julie, because um, I know, like you said, different places have different, you know, kind of setups. In Idaho, we did receive a Think College grant last year to build state capacity. And we've been, you know, looking at other colleges around us. Some of them do have students duly, duly enrolled, like you said, like where they're using their transition program to be on campus. Um, and so one of the discussions we've had in Idaho is, will that financial help? I mean, would there be a financial incentive for a college to have dual enrolled kids? Could the college tap into some of that IDEA money, I mean, would the district pay the college? I don't know if you know about any of those kind of arrangements. Well, and I think it's interesting because I think that you and I certainly have had these conversations when Nick and Dylan both were coming to college and that idea of college is not a free, appropriate public education. And therefore, the idea of faith is lost at college in theory and in reality, I guess. And so that's where that conversation comes a lot around the idea of can students be duly enrolled, receiving services at the college level under IDEA, which FAPE is an absolute requirement of that. And so I don't necessarily know the answer to that because it's not something that because of the way the Senate bill was passed and the Senate bill is what directed that in the state of Colorado was in the, that they students couldn't be duly enrolled. Um, but I think as a, as a 
community looking at building and having the capacity to do some research, I think it is worth talking to the colleges that do have dual enrollment and the colleges that don't and see what if, if there is a financial benefit to the university and if that if you're having trouble getting in the front door, make that's the incentive that you start with um, and I think it's just being very careful that you're not running a transition program on a college campus that's not in, you know an inclusive model which just my own thing but um, that's certainly what we've tried to build here is an inclusive model right and that's I think that's the caution for parents when they go on to think college website um, because you really have to dig into it mm -hmm. more to see everyone's definition of inclusion we know is different. So um, yeah, I mean, there are places where they almost have this segregated transition right. program on a college campus and they're calling that inclusive post-secondary opportunities. And I, I would not see it that way. So, um, you know, when you look at college descriptions and you look at the description of the supports that they offer, you really want to have some good conversations. And like most kids, you want to visit the campus and everything to see what it really is like versus a written description of their, you know, their supports. Yeah, and I agree. And I think, Charmaine, one of the things, you know, that I've always shared with parents when they, you know, I, I'm connected with the Down Center community here in Colorado Springs and people say, you know, I'm moving to Colorado what's the best school and what's the best, you know, district to live in. And, you know, the, it's, you can get uh, 10 different answers on any given day. And someone will say, oh, my school's the most inclusive school. My school's the best school. And I always say to parents, what you need to ask is, what does a typical day look like for your student? So your student goes to school, they get off the bus, and then what happens? Because what I think is great might not be what you think is great. And what I think is inclusion might not be what you think is inclusion. So again, making sure, and we do that a lot. We have a lot of families who, when they apply to UCCS for services through our office, ask to talk to other families because they do want to know, are, is the picture we're painting what our students are actually experiencing? And are there times where students are, you know, are they in classes? Are they not in classes? So that is across the board when you're talking and looking at schools, but certainly for college, because I do agree, those descriptions can be out there. And you really want to make sure that those descriptions meet what you're looking for. And there's lots of different options for lots of different families. And so finding the right fit, a lot of states have a lot of different options. And so um, learning those as well. But yeah, it's really important to find out what does, what on a day-to-day -day basis, what does classes and the, their Day. And that's what Ben is going to share with us on a day-to-day -day basis. What does his days look like here at UCCS? Right. And I think I think now there's only like 266 colleges listed mm -hmm. on Think College's website. So, and when you look at the map, most of those are on the East Coast. So the West is finally kind of catching up here. But um, like Julie said, there are different kinds of um, supports offered. So yeah, that's just something that you would want to look into. Um, hopefully, you know, there will be more and more choices for students because like you said, I mean, only a few, you know, five additional students each year. So the capacity of those 266 college sites, you know, we're only being able to serve a small fraction. Um, but, and I wanted to give a shout out to Selena. Selena's here and Selena is, um, her daughter is going to be a freshman next year at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And she's gonna be coming from Idaho to Colorado. So I'm kind of jealous that she gets to <laughs> Colorado. But um, so yeah, so I'm sure Selena, is excited but also a little nervous which is how we all are when our kids go away to college right <laughs> but let's go back here because i know you were talking about eligibility and i'm not sure i'm sorry i interrupted you if we got all of those items. so i think the other thing that we really just looking at eligibility is we really want to make sure that the student has a desire to go to college they have to have an intellectual disability defined on an iep or defined through idea we do not need iq testing we just need a diet um we need the um, eligibility determined through the school system or um 
through another means, but an IQ test is not required. And the most, the, probably the number one thing we need is that this is the desire of the student to go to college, not the desire of the parent to go to college. And I think Ben can attest to this, college is hard work. Our students work extremely hard here. And if you don't have a desire, you don't really wanna be here, um, that it's really hard to keep, keep a student engaged. And so that's the number one question that we um, require and we ask of our students. Um, all of our students receive credit for the classes they take and all of our students receive letter grades. And that's not, that's another one of those good questions to ask as you start to look through the college. Some colleges do pass fail. Some students are audit students, which is what we had here at UCCS, but we wanted students to receive credits, our students receive transcripts with all their grades, um, and those grades are modified, those assignments are modified, and I can talk about that. And when our stu students leave here, they will receive a comprehensive higher education certificate um, in the area of study that they've determined, and so we work with students to determine that area of um, study. And this comprehensive higher education certificate is something that we're working on at the state level with UNC, Arapaho Community College, and us, so that that certificate coming out of all of the opportunities here in Colorado, that students are leaving with the same thing. <clears throat> so students take typical academic classes. Our students participate in all of the social activities that they want to. Some students, there are requirements for academics. There are requirements for campus participation. There are requirements for internships and jobs. Um, and so sometimes we have to require students to go to social events. Um, and sometimes we have students that go to every single social event. Um, and all of our students do internships. All of our students um, get paid jobs on campus or off campus. And our students have the opportunity to live on campus if that's something that they wanna do. Next slide. Um, so our students typically take two to three academic classes per semester. Like I said, they earn grades. Over the four years, our students um, receive 54 credits. And so this is where that certificate component comes in um, because they're not doing the credits that it would take to get to a bachelor's degree over four years. And they earn their certificate. Our students do all of the course reading. They do all of the assignments. They're modified. Um, to meet it, each person's individual learning styles and learning needs. And that's the biggest part of the job that I do here is working with professors and our student mentors and our students to get to make sure that the modifications we're doing are the correct um, for each student. I will say just about every week I get an email from a professor who is amazed at how hard our students work. And um, one professor said he wished that all of his students worked as hard and was committed as the student that he had that was receiving services to our office because he said it would make a difference in their classes if all of our students were committed as our students were. All right, next slide. So a really big component here, obviously, you know, people go to college so that they can um, have better opportunities for jobs. And certainly as we look at the unemployment rate for people with intellectual disabilities um, in our country, it's something that obviously we need to do something about. And so that's one of the reasons why a lot of emphasis has been put on the career development that can happen in college. And so, like I said, all of our students have the opportunity to do on and off campus internships. Those are required um, on and off campus employment. We um, do a college and career class, and this is a piece that is part of our Senate bill. It was written into the bill. So all three of the colleges here in Colorado do, a, um, it's an, the only time that our students are, that we serve through our office are together. It's one and a half hours per week, and we work on those college and career components. So making sure students have the organizational skills they need, navigating their emails, navigating their, e um, their calendars, um, working on resumes, doing job types of things. And so that's what we do within that college and career class. Uh, we have a partnership with our College of Education and something got cut off there. Are, we have course facilitators, so our students have the opportunity to facilitate courses um, with faculty here on campus. And Ben has had that opportunity. And again, our our faculty love that. Our students that attend those classes love that because they get to see that idea of that inclusive model 
live out in class every single day. Um, and the photo, these two photos here, this happens to be someone I care a lot about. These pictures are Nick. And Nick loves cars. Nick loved cars since, I don't know, since he was three. I don't know where it's hereditary if you're a Harmon, I guess. And so he started here at UCCS working at the transportation department and he would work on the cars and he would, you know, learn how to change oil that came from high school and high school. He took auto shop classes and had the opportunities to learn those things. And then he was employed by a local car wash here in Colorado Springs. And so you can see where that fit comes. We start to see where on campus can they learn the skills they need to go into our community and have better opportunities for employment. Um, and so that's what we work. We have another young man who, if we don't know where to find him, um, we go to the library. He wants to be a librarian. He loves books. He loves everything there is to know about books. He's currently doing an internship in the library, and that will that will transition into a um, internship and paid employment in local in our local community at the library. So those are the types of things we do to build on career development. Um, so here. Um, we work very closely with DVR in our state, and so this was some data I had to put together for DVR, and I thought it was worth sharing here. Um, our employment outcomes as of this spring semester, here's the, the campus and community, community employment. These are students that are employed at above, min, above minimum wage in our community. We have found the University of Colorado to be a great employer. We have three students who are employed as ushers at our end center. We have two students who are employed at the campus catering. So one works in our uh, cafeteria part and then one works in catering. We have one student who's employed at our campus bookstore and one student who's employed at our campus coffee center, which is her dream job because she's loved laminating things. And so um, that's a nice natural fit for her as well. And then in the, in the community, we have student employed at a nonprofit and as I said, Nick at the car wash. The internships we have happening currently in our campus and in our community, the library, I said, campus transportation, the Department of Ed. We have a student doing her internship at campus tours. Uh, our local preschool um, in our community, we have a student doing an internship. We have another student at another local nonprofit doing an internship. Her interest is around self-advocacy and helping people with disabilities find their voice. And so she's working um, at an internship in a local community, in a local nonprofit, local elementary school, and then one of our local design stores. We have a young lady interested in design and all things the color pink. Um, and so she's at the local design store where she helps the people they're going out. It's a store that has like carpets and tiles and bathrooms. And so they say, we're going out to a house today. Um, we need to take blues. They want to look at blues for their bathrooms. And so she goes and pulls the tiles and the things that she thinks might be in that color set um, to help um, the person who's going out on the job to do those things. And so she loves, um, and then she organizes everything by color, which is another thing she loves to do. Another thing that we do here on campus, I love how Charmaine just keeps me moving. I think my husband wishes he could do that every day. Um, so independent living is another thing, and Ben can talk about his, his um, experiences living here. But we do have on-campus apartments that our students live in, and we collaborate with an outside organization here called Foundation for Successful Living to provide the supports in the housing. Um, families are able to utilize waivers that they have, um, and so that's been a really nice fit for us. And so that's, again, that's another big question to ask as you start to navigate through looking at different colleges, is what types of supports available. We have students, if students lived in the dorms, which our hope is to get through the wait list here in the dorms, um, but outside people can't come into the dorm. So if students need some support around um, housekeeping or need some support around, um, you know, their hair, we have, you know, some of our students struggled with getting conditioner washed out of their hair. People can't go in and do that. And so we have found that these on-campus apartments have for the time being been the right fit for us so that um, it's the right supports for our students where we're at. Um, we also will, um, we have cooking classes that we do through the summer. And then our students all participate in the cooking classes that are offered to any student here at UCCF. Um, we have a driver's ed course, and then we do bus and shuttle training so that our students know how to get off campus safely, as well as Uber and Lyft training so that we are really building on those independent living skills. Can you open that? All right, next slide. Um, clubs and fitnesses, like fitness, like I said, our students have a requirement um, to 
be involved here on campus. It's not just the academic piece. Our students are required to take fitness classes or work out at the gym, and they have to participate in a club or something on campus. We find sometimes clubs are a little bit of a challenge, but again, they have to be participating in the social activities as well. Next slide. And our students, of course, have a lot of fun on campus. Um, I just cracked up when I was looking through pictures to share just the just the hundreds of things our students do. So our students go to plays, concerts, they love the dances on campus. Spirit Week week is Roar Days on campus. So our students are loving everything about Roar Days. It's um, our theme this year is SpongeBob or the yeah. um, Nickelodeon. And so they're all they're out there searching today for free shirts, which Ben can't find. So he's going to leave here and go find his shirt. Um, and just all the things that happen, the sporting events, um, the soccer, the lacrosse, the baseball games our students like to go to. There's students in the picture cooking, doing the cooking class. Um, they go downtown. They participate in the parade. UCCS participates in our parade. So our students, all students from UCCS participate in the parades as well. And then homecoming, there's a picture up there from homecoming as well. All righty, this is what I wanted to make sure we got to. I wanted everybody to have the opportunity to hear from Ben. So make sure you project your voice, Ben. Yes, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. There you go. Okay, next slide. You just tell Charmaine next slide when you're ready. Oh, there we go. Next slide. So I am Ben Kim, and I am a sophomore here at UCCS. And those are the and these are the pictures of me from my um for my freshman year. Um, the first picture re represents when I, when I took a machine shop class, which, was, which happens to be one of my favorite fun classes. And so much of a favorite class. How many times did you do it? Oh, two times. <laughs> I did like two times this, my, my, my past school year, freshman and sophomore. It, it was a lot of fun, I, I have to say. But yeah, that's a picture of me um, in my machine shop class, building building something, like working on the machines. And the second picture represents um, when I was at a cooking class. I made sushi, which happens to be one of my favorite foods ever, because <laughs> my family my family loves sushi, and I I love sushi too. So, and that's why. Um, wait. Who, who signed me up for that sushi cooking class? I think I signed you up. Yeah, a, it's a requirement that all of our students do a live cooking class at least. You know how much I love sushi, right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I signed up you and Caitlin, and you loved oh. it, and Caitlin hated it. So that's how it goes. <laughs> that's all right. But yeah, that is a picture of me um, in, a, in my sushi cooking class. And the third picture is when I took a, my GPS class. We've had which the name was called Mindstorms, which was a fun and hard class at the same time. And I was holding my robot there because I was showing I was showing Julie, you, like the, the different programs that I, that I put into and like what it can do. That was one cool, one fun thing I liked about that class. It was like building a Lego set almost <laughs> similar. <laughs> But yeah, those are those are me, and um, that's the picture. The, the fourth picture is I was working at the end center on Friday night, which which happens to be the day of the of the play. Well, the show called the OIS Intelligent Lies, and I and what I like about working at the end center is I I scan people's tickets and. I know this is gonna sound a little funny, but after I scan people's tickets, like when the show starts, I just stay in my boat and do absolutely nothing. <laughs> that's an, I mean, that's what I like to do usually out when I work there. Is just scan people's tickets and just stay at my post and do whatever I want. But yeah, that that's me working at the end center. And another picture, um, another picture. Re that represents me of me is I was at the St. Patrick's Day parade with with the OIS group, and if you want to know who who I'm putting my arm around is 
<laughs> well, just giving a buddy hug is my my roommate Michael. He and I are our roommates, and we've been we've been very good roommates ever since freshman year. We've been hanging out a lot. We've been doing movie nights. We've been just having fun. And the and last week but not least, that's the that's me and all the guys. We we were doing a guys' night outing at BJ's. And because so, oh no, you're fine. Um, and one thing that you should know about me is I plan. I like to plan guys' nights outing to to anywhere, whether it's in the university village or if it's at my apartment, like just doing movie nights, and almost anywhere. So Ben is really good about doing these guys' nights out. He's really good about, he's better than anyone I know at keeping them scheduled and keeping them going. Because you know how many of us do girls' night or ladies' night? We do it two times and we never do it again. Ben's really good at doing it. And he's really good at making sure people need to take Uber, that he um, helps people who don't maybe know how to use Uber. He makes sure that he's very inclusive of all of our students. So even the students who live off campus so that they're aware of when um, guys' nights are happening. So Ben has definitely been a leader in our um, social off-campus events that have happened. So maybe a future job in event planning, Ben. Oh, <laughs> that could be something. Yes. Since I do, since I am good at planning events. You are good at planning events, you're right. Maybe I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, so the next picture is that 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 was me and my friends Michael and Nick Rape. We were eating dinner at Cheddar's before we saw the movie Smallfoot. That was back in October, which happened to be a really fun time for us. And and the next picture is the time when me, Michael, and Ryan were at the Denver Art Museum for a field trip from one of my art classes that I took last semester. Next slide. All right, I'll move quickly through these because I, I want to make sure people have time, especially the, the, those that have questions for Ben. I want to make sure that they get questions answered. Again, this is probably the number one question I get asked is this piece about the financial part of it. So this is just kind of a breakdown of where we're at currently. So tuition here for the number of credits that our students take per semester is about 2,600. Um, and then our office has a charge for service at 3,500 a semester. Um, which provides all of the things that our office provides, our student mentors that go to classes with students that need a student mentor to go with them, um, the work that we do around accommodations and modifications, um, coordinating of schedules, the outing events that we do, those types of things. And then the additional UCCS fees that these are required from the university, so the Wellness Center, being able to use our recreation center, um, the performance fee, they add up to $750. It always shocks me when I see that. Um, financial aid will be available when we become CTP approved. Um, again, this was a requirement under the Senate bill that at the end of five years, all three of our, the um, programs here in Colorado had to be CTP approved. Um, Arapaho Community College and UNC just recently got those approvals and we ours are at the powers that be. But once that goes through, um, then families and uh, students will be able to access financial aid, um, which will be helpful for families, but it also becomes an interesting dynamic for families receiving funding through DVR because then DVR will become the funder um, for the payer of last resort. So families will be required to do to go through those financial aid components to access DVR. So it's kind of those interesting things. A lot of our students, I'd say probably 40% of our students receive funding from DVR. Um, students also get funding through scholarships and, and um, private pay is how most of our students are financing college at this point. So what, do you wanna tell our viewers what CTP stands for, Julie? Um, it's Certified Transition Program, and it's just a, it's a vetting um, process that a lot, uh, another good question to ask those think college um, sites, is are they CTP approved? And it's a vetting process through the university and through the federal, you know, through the federal government. They look at what you're doing as a certified transition program. If you meet the requirements of that, then families are eligible for financial aid because we've been vetted and are, you know, we meet the criteria of that vetting process. Okay, thanks. 
Uh-huh. So then the other question I get asked a lot, and this um, ties into the worksheet or the handout that Charmaine shared, um, is just I get often asked, what are things that we can work on? And that handout will go in more in depth. But one of the things that we obviously really recommend is that idea of working on independence. So you know, if you have a high school student, making sure that they can navigate the, the high school campus. Because when they come to college, they have to be able to navigate the campus. Um, do they have to be able to navigate the campus the first day they put their foot here? Absolutely not. But they all they are going to need to be independent on campus. And so working on that middle school and high school, going to classes on your own, not having a pair or walk with you. If pair support is needed, meet, meet them in class. Um, but really building those types of independence that can happen on a campus. Um, developing academic interest, making sure students a love of reading and um, I have the opportunity to be have access to all of the richness that happens in our high schools every day, um, biology classes, all of those things that lend themselves for students to be successful in college classes. Our students have to be able to sit through college classes. Some of our college classes, Ben is in a class currently with 290 students in a big lecture hall. He has to be able to, to hang with the other students. He has to stay awake. He has to figure out the tools he needs to take notes. Some of our students have note takers. Ben is an excellent note taker, so he does not have a note taker, but some students do, and so those are the things we navigate through. If students need the AT, that they begin to work on that. Um, we work a lot with students with um, AT, um, assistive technology, but there's so many great things out there, and so having students have access to that. Being included, having the ability, those richness, again, the social aspects that happen in a high school or what happens at colleges. Um, we have a, the students who come to us when they're 18 certainly know a lot of students on campus because they've been included and they know, you know, students come from their high school to go here as well. We also recommend the idea of writing a college bound IEP. So, um, in order to attend college, Upon graduation, the student will blah, 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 blah. Um, we'll take, you know, high school English class. We'll um, take notes. We'll whatever. But always putting in there in order to do this, to go to college, they're going to do these types of things in the high school or their middle school. Having the opportunities to volunteer, that helps lend itself to that idea of what their career might be. So if it's a student who knows that they love um to be to work with cars and they want to do something with cars maybe exploring the different places that they could volunteer to do that or for people who don't know what they want to do which is a probably 80 percent of students who go to college with or without disabilities volunteering helps maybe find a place that might be a career path taking on responsibilities at home the idea of those independent living skills that are going to be a must for students that are living on campus um, beginning to work on those helping students through you know learning and, and advocating for themselves that's something that has to happen at college because students have to advocate um, for what it is they need and if they need modifications those types of things and um, we work on those certainly here but the students that come ready for those makes um, it, the opportunities are open for a lot of other things on campus when they come with those skills and then the learning to manage money um, this is something we continue to work on with students we run a budgeting group that we have students that work on budgeting our students who are employed on campus and live on campus they meet once a week with our campus and coordinate um, community coordinator to make sure that they're getting their their paychecks are getting done their timesheets are getting done um, and that they're um, that they have money for what they want to do over the weekend. So we work a lot on budgets. So and and I was thinking, Julie, it would probably be a great follow up show <laughs> for us to have been back again in yourself to talk about some apps that students use. I know Dylan used a live scribe pen yeah. um, notes, and that was really helpful. But because I think a lot of the apps and learning the, you know, accessibility features of a cell phone, students can start learning that now in yeah. high school. And then, like you said, that, that just makes that transition a little bit smoother when they're attending college classes. But, and just how, how you're helping um, modify assignments, because again, I think that could apply to high school classes and it could give parents and teachers some great ideas. So 
We'll have to have you back as a returning, as both returning guests. <laughs> I will say I modified, um, so I modified majority of the quizzes and the midterms and some of the assignments. I will say that our, the campus has really, that the idea of differentiated instruction has certainly found its way to the college campus. Um, I don't think 28 years ago when Nick was born and the doctor told me he had Down syndrome, would I ever think that he would enroll in a college physics class? But he's currently taking a college physics class. And the other day he was taking his midterm and he was reading through it. And he goes, no, I know that's the torque. I know that's the answer. The teacher that teaches this college physics class, he has a PowerPoint that is an interactive PowerPoint that he puts on his website. And so students can view that before class. So they have pre-learning. They go to class and he shows hands-on experiences around, it's called physics in the everyday life. So he shows how a bag of chips at altitude explode, explodes. And you think, you know, my 28 year, year old son doesn't love seeing chips explode. Um, and then he talks about, and then, um, he, then you can view that class again afterwards. All his notes are on. So that's what he does just as a teacher, not because of what we're doing here, but is it's the perfect setup for students. And then I had a teacher, I modified her quiz. It was an essay question, and I turn a lot of essay questions into multiple choice. So I go through and identify questions. I send them back to the professors for them to make sure that what I have there is correct. And I had a teacher ask me if I would format all of her quizzes for her because she said I did a much better job than she did. And so I haven't taken on that task because I don't have time. But, um, you know, multiple choice questions, we take away two of them. And so um, it just, and it really just depends on the student and the, the supports, but I'm happy to talk about and show we have tons of examples. It's something um, that we've really started to make sure we're documenting because um, I think that that's the thing that's um, can be unique to what's happening on campuses when you start talking about they're taking college courses, how's that modification happening? And I think it's important to see how you can do that in a really meaningful way so that they're still doing all of the activities. Um, some students, instead of doing, one student had to do a like a 20 page research paper on the law. She interviewed, she went down and interviewed someone for Peak Parent Center on IDEA and turned in her video for her assignment instead of um, turning in a written paper. That teacher said, you know what, I think I'm gonna give videos as an opportunity to other students because it showed a different side of what she knew because she was able to show it in a video and not write it. And so I think we're helping shape those things as well as we define what modifications can look like. And we're very creative in how we modify. Wow, and that's, yeah, that is something that is, I always felt like that was fu the fun part of my job as a special ed teacher was modifying curriculum. Um, and, I'm sh and I'm sure it's so nice to get kind of a cohort of professors mm -hmm. that are already like implementing universal design for learning and they can share that with their colleagues because I think so many times when a peer shares an idea, it gets, um, you know, that it's, more widely accepted. <laughs> so right. I'm sure as time goes on, and and just like in school, you know, when more professors offer those options, it not only helps that student that's part of the inclusive program, but it helps every student in that college class. Right, right, I agree. Yes, so we have um, another, the, our last slide here is to show you Julie's contact information. Um, so I wanna make sure that we share that with folks. And if you want to get in touch with Julie, there's her um, office phone number, her uh, email address, and the website where you can find more information too. <sighs> So um, we have a couple questions here. So let me bring those up and I'm gonna bring this slide down. <laughs> so um, Patsy is in Colorado Springs and she says, can students go to UCCS year round or what do they do in the summer? Well, hi Patsy. Um, 
The students do not go year round to U at UCCS at this point. We have not established a way in which that works. We do do some things. We do a boot camp, um, as Selena knows. Um, all of our students will come for a week um, in August, and that's the boot camp kind of thing. But our students do what every other college student does at, on summer. Um, some students stay here. Ben stays here. Ben works. Um, some students go home. Our commuter students go are at home over the summer, just like um, any other college student. Um, they can take summer classes. We've had a few students take summer classes. Our summer classes at college are not as much fun, we don't think. They tend to do them to to for working people who work. Um, so they'll do intensive courses. So there'll be a week long course every day from eight to five. That is not the best learning model for what we think students should be doing. So even the summer program, the summer classes are shortened. It's still not a 16 week semester over the summer. And so Ben, you took a summer class last year. Oh, I did not. You did not? No, no. Oh, Dylan summer. did. Yeah, yeah. Dylan took um, Yeah, we had a couple students who took um, summer classes. And so it's an option if students want to do that. This summer, we haven't found any classes that work for the students who wanted to do summer classes. Um, and so, the, like I said, summer looks like summer for most college students. Most, you know, high school students don't, you know, their summers aren't planned. And so um, our students, I think, are looking forward to summer coming and not being on campus. But we we do a, a few things we're going to do. Um, some cooking, healthy cooking, and we do a few activities, but not an organized summer plan. Cool. So can you adjust your camera just a little oh, bit? Sorry. Yeah. I never you. know what people are seeing. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, Marjorie has a comment here. So let me pull this one up. She said, I want her, speaking of her daughter, to go to college, but I have a few more years to convince her that she wants to. Um, public school has was very negative during middle school, but high school has been a little better so far, even though inclusion is still a bit of a struggle. Well, I, I mean, I think, Marjorie, you don't have a question, but I think just in thinking this, I do think that some, some students don't go to college. Every student doesn't, every person doesn't go to college. Um, and so I think exploring what's available in colleges, I think maybe going and doing a tour, I highly recommend going to college tours when they're really fun. Um, and it gives you a sense of what's happening at college. And she may get a sense that that's something she likes and she may not, and she may not go to college. She may choose to do the hundreds of other things that are out there for people to do. Um, but I think it's making sure that if that's her dream and that's always what we've wanted to do, if it's somebody's dream, we wanna be here for the people who wanna be here. Um, but I know college isn't for everybody. And I think I wanna make sure that we talk a lot about inclusion and I think, you know, Charmaine and I come and Dr. Casa and Christy, we come from um, a very inclusive mindset. And I wholeheartedly believe in inclusion. My boys, lives are amazing because of the opportunities they've had in inclusive classrooms. And I want us also say in our community, that's been very inclusive as well. But a student who hasn't been included, it doesn't mean they can't come to college. They're going to learn what inclusion looks like pretty quickly when they come to college. And so I don't want anyone to think, well, my, my student didn't get the opportunity. Our school doesn't do inclusion. And trust me, I hear that every single day. So I get it, um, that they're not a candidate for college. Everybody's a candidate for college if they want to go to college. And those are the things we have to explore and how do we make them get them prepared, even if they didn't have an inclusive opportunities in high school, they can have inclusive opportunities at college. Yes, and so we, you know, as parents are so grateful because this just opens up another option for our kids. And like you said, it's not for everyone, just like college isn't for every other student. Um, but at least if it's an option, then our kids can decide. And I know, you know, sometimes a student will go a semester and then say, you know, maybe this college isn't the right place or, or maybe I do want to, you know, look at finding a career versus going to college. So I think, you know, we don't want to make judgments. We want to create more options for everybody. Um, 
And so Ben, I would love to know, like, since you've been at UCCS a couple of years now and you are such a student leader, what advice would you give to students that are thinking of going to college? So the advice that I would give to them is if they, if they were planning to go to college, like say to UCCS, I would tell, I would tell them about like what it's like to, to be a college student and like how you, how the tip, how your like typical day like goes on campus. And if you, and if you want to live like at the, um, like, like housing, like at the lookout apartments, I would tell them that, that if you want, if you were to be living at the, um, if you want to live at the lookout apartments, you would have to, um, they would have to like sign a contract lease. I know. I mean, no, it's not, it's not necessary to say, but that's it's just my, that's just a, um, like a rule one and like two if if they were if they wanted to like just live with some roommates like a quad bedroom or wherever they would have to uh, they'll have to communicate with them really well if they were to be having some issues with their roommates they would they would have to um like contact julie or christy and even the apartment manager. But to me, I, I mean, I didn't have any problems with my roommates last year or this year, so I'm I'm fine. But I'm just giving some advice to like the students who who want to, who want to live like in the apartments on campus. And I know I know there that you have peer mentors that will help some students. And I don't know if you have a peer mentor for any of your classes, Ben, but could you describe a little bit of what that looks like? So how, so what it is, is so what it is, um, if you were to be having a men, if you were to be having a mentor to go to class with you, you would um, meet them at a, um, at a certain time and place. Sometimes you would, you would meet them in class. And then what do they do when, if, so, when a student, when um, you're taking a social intro to social justice, right? You have a mentor who goes with you to that class. Yeah. So what are some things that a mentor does to help you? And I think your psychology class. So for Ben's psychology class, he goes to class on his own and then he meets with a mentor to kind of debrief, to help for quizzes, to plan for quizzes, to take exams. And that's something we do. Some of our students, the mentor goes with them to class and is with them. Some of our students go to class on their own, but need that organizational debriefing kind of thing so what are some things you do with hannah and what are some things that you do when you have a mentor who's in class with you so the, so the things that i do with hannah are i do i do my exams and the quizzes i normally do with julie you mm -hmm. but the um because most of the stuff is, like the work is online i do my mastery trainings and my chapters on my own just the only time I, I need mentor, mentor support and Julie is on my exams and quizzes. And for my social justice class, the mentor just sit, sit, sits next to me and she would um, like just tell me to like what to write down. Or if I got lost, she would just write for me and she would show me like what I need to write just so I can like keep on, stay on track. And our mentors help with assign, you know, making sure students understand assignments. I meet with mentors weekly to go through modifications. So they have an upcoming assignment. How is that going to look for each individual student? Um, and so the mentors are kind of our eyes and ears for students that need that um, so that we make sure all of the work's getting completed. Our mentors also, where did you, before you came over to meet to do this, where were you at? Where you got to go? Before you came over here, where did you come from? I came, I was at homework club. So what, tell them about homework club. So we run two homework clubs a week. So homework club is where um, students work on their homework with, with mentor support. Some of them work like independently outside the library or just anywhere. But for me, I, um, I sometimes like to do homework on my own unless I need um, some mentor support for it, for that. 
So yeah, that's that's what um that's how Homer Club normally um goes for me. Well, it sounds like UCCS has been a a perfect match for you, Ben, and oh, it's been a really great match for me and my family. So, do you do you have a course of study that you're looking at? Do you have like an idea of a a job after college that you're you're wanting to you know kind of learn and move towards so i know my major is i'm studying leadership and human services and the job that i that i'm going to be doing after i graduate um sorry um, excuse me where was i yes so the job that i'm going to be doing after i graduate um college is i'm I'll be working as an official OIS employee, meaning I'll be working in the in the inclusive services with Christy, John, and Julie, and Linda. And what I'll be doing is I'll be helping students like where things are on campus. I will especially especially I'm just like helping them like walk over to the events just so they won't get get lost on their own. And I will also be helping them out in classes, helping them out on their homework. And if I need to attend weekend activities, things like that. Things things that a um, OIS employee employee would, would normally do. It'll be kind of similar to John's. Well, that is so wonderful. And I think you have the skills and the personality that that will be like you'll just be a wonderful person for you know kind of the go-to guy when when other students have questions so that sounds exciting i'm really excited for you do you um julie or ben have any closing words that you would like to share with our viewers so there is one thing i would like to say i just want to thank you and but thank you for your time for for letting me present about my college life experience and how and how is it going and how that's going for me and and lastly but not least thank you. i'm just i'm glad i was able to present today with julie well thank you ben thank you thank you you're um, welcome <laughs> and julie do you have any final words of wisdom for us? I'm not sure if I have any wisdom, but um, making sure people have my contact information. I'm happy to answer questions, um, call, email, um, Facebook, however that works for people. Um, I want to make sure that if I didn't get your questions answered today or if you, know, if you have a young child, I also want to encourage people to just not lose sight of what's out there for students and for their loved ones with disabilities. And I think, um, you know, as we talked about, college is such a rich opportunity for learning and um, exploring. And so I am pleased that we now have these opportunities in Colorado. Um, I know there's lots of opportunities in our country. And so making sure families find the place that's the right place for them and for their student and um, making sure that you know, you don't settle for what you think is the only option, that you go out there and find the option that's the right place and the right fit. And, um, you know, to continue to build those dreams of college and build those dreams of what employment could look like. I mean, I think we are hopeful and we can't wait to start seeing data come from Colorado as we head into our fourth and fifth year and we start to graduate students to see where we are with, with jobs. We've been pleasantly surprised at the students that have, found employment on campus and have found employment in our community and we wanted to continue to build on that and so um, i want people to continue to have those dreams and have those high expectations as we begin to really reach those um and see where you know where we go from here well absolutely and i think you know another part of advocacy for parents is to reach out to colleges and universities in your state um, and if they don't have right now any kinds of, you know, formalized supports and services for students with intellectual dis disabilities to start that conversation. Um, and, you know, I think there are, I think Tennessee and Florida also had state laws passed that deal with inclusive education and higher ed. 
So I know in Idaho, that's one of the things that we're looking at is how can we maybe um, find a sponsor and pursue some legislative action mm -hmm. to get this in place in Idaho. But there are options. And sometimes if your local college doesn't have it, your son or daughter could be a trailblazer and they can start and um, do some informal supports and still be successful. So I encourage parents to um, talk with their child and make sure that this is a dream that they have versus just a parent dream <laughs> um, because we wanna be supporting our students and our kids with what they envision for their future. But it is so exciting because we have so many families around the country that their child has been included through school and now college is kind of that next step. So finally that is being kind of opened up for more people. So I appreciate both you, Julie and Ben for coming on today. Um, I do host this show every Thursday at noon Mountain Time. Next week, we have a show about extended school year and how one size does not fit all and how parents can make sure that if their child um, qualifies for extended school year services, that those are individualized and you don't have to only have the option of what the district traditionally offers families. So. I hope you can tune in next Thursday at noon Mountain Time. Until then, I am Charmaine Tanner, and thank you for joining us. Take care. Bye-bye, Ben. Bye. Bye. <laughs>